Going up to page 43. We've talked about the mechanical work with each of those chapters. Doctor's opinion, turning statements into questions. First half of Bill's story, marking what you can relate to from your drunkologue. 9 to 16, seeing what you're resistant, resistant to or unwilling to do in the rest of the work. Marking that resistance, seeing how it changes, seeing how you become less resistant. 17 to 23, we've looked at the rest of the physical craving to be convinced that once I put alcohol in my system, something happens, which makes it impossible for me to control how much I'm going to drink. We've looked from 23 to 43 at the mental obsession. What takes me back to the first drink? Can I keep myself stopped? We had a great review at the top of 23 about the craving. We had a great review at the bottom of 43 about the obsession. On 44, they reminded me of those two points again. When I honestly want to, I can't stay stopped. And when drinking, I have little control over the amount. You need to have both to be powerless. And then they raise a new question. If those two things are true, do I believe I'm suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer? Last sentence in the first paragraph on 44. You see, I've worked with people that are absolutely convinced about the craving, absolutely convinced about the obsession, but they think there's something other than a spiritual experience that will conquer their alcoholism. And they go back into step zero and they stop and they start eliminating other options then they're, because they're not convinced that they suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Maybe you have a disease that something else can conquer it. So this is a major point. And I also have to tell you how I came to my truth about drugs and alcohol. I believe that you can have the physical craving for drugs. I believe you can have the mental obsession for drugs, but you're not a real addict. Here's what I mean by that. I did all these pages with Don up to this point. I saw that there are many drugs I've had a physical craving for. A normal person could smoke crack and get a craving for more crack. You can't do cocaine without getting a craving for more. Any non-alcoholic you can think of. I always go back to my mother, even though she passed away two years ago, God rest her soul. I always go back to the person that I knew personally was absolutely not alcoholic. She could have a drink and a half. She was one of these people that mystify you because they say things like, I better stop now because I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> I'm the guy in a restaurant with 2,000 people in a huge room bigger than this. I see the one person that leaves half a drink. The fact that they're drinking doesn't bother me. The fact that anyone in the world would leave half a drink just baffles me. Right? So what I'm saying is that I started the work the first time. I don't know what I am. I'm still wondering what's wrong with me. Am I addict? Am I alcoholic? Am I both? Are they the same? I did the work up to this point, and I saw the physical craving and the mental obsession for both. And I'm happy. I like NA. I like AA at the time. I would be happy to have found out I'm both. So what? It gives you two reasons to do the work. You're screwed either way. You're a double loser, right? You're not going to have these reservations that an alcoholic might have 20 years later. Maybe he can do some drugs and get away with it. An addict alcoholic is in a great position because they're screwed either way they go. Right? So I was content thinking I'm going to find out my truth is going to be that I'm both. He said, now, just because we've seen the physical craving and the mental obsession, which your mother would get for some drugs, she doesn't get it with alcohol. And just because I had seen the craving and the obsession for both drugs and alcohol didn't mean I was a real addict. And he said, now what we have to do is go back to page 20. And I think now, after somebody has seen the craving and the obsession, this is the page where you'll find your truth. Because it talks about the moderate drinker. The hard drinker, which AA is filled with, the moderate drinker, the hard drinker, and the real alcoholic, okay? Moderate isn't even something that's in my vocabulary. I do not need to look at moderate anything. If, it's, if I do it, I don't do it. I don't do anything moderately in my life. If I do it, I do it. If I don't, I don't. 
So moderate wasn't really a consideration. But it does say the moderate drinker has little trouble giving up liquor entirely, staying stopped, if he has a good reason. They can take it or leave it. That's not me with drugs or alcohol. That's probably not anybody in this room unless you're just a member of Al-Anon. And it still could be true. But that would be, could you be a moderate Al-Anon who can give it up entirely thinking about the alcohol? <laughs> that disease I don't know, so I'm not going to speculate on their disease. I do know that we're their drug. But that's another story we'll get to later. But what about the hard drinker? And I believe these three terms, moderate, hard, and real, are as appropriate to the drug user as the drinker. So I'm looking at these three types in relationship to drugs and alcohol, and here's where I found my truth. The, the hard drinker or the hard drugger can have a habit, can be impaired physically and mentally, might even die before his time, but given a sufficiently strong reason, Ill health, falling in love, change of environment, warning of a doctor. It could be making up your own mind. It could be a judge. It could be a wife. This person can stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and may even need medical attention. But what about the real alcoholic? What about the real addict? They may start off as a moderate user or a moderate drinker. And here's an interesting point. The, the real alcoholic may or may not even become a continuous hard drinker. The real alcoholic might not even become as bad as the guy we just read about. Haven't you heard of people with worse drunkologues than yours that just don't drink, that choose not to, that were able to stop, but they had a bad habit. They got a hell of a drunkologue. They got horrible war stories, and it might even kill them. But when they were given a sufficiently strong reason, they could stop. So... This guy, the real alcoholic, may start off as a moderate, may or may not even become a hard drinker, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose control over his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. And, given a sufficiently strong reason, he can't stop. And they're back to the same two points that we just looked at on 44. Same two points. So here's where I found my truth. By this book, by this process, I am a hard drug user, who's a real alcoholic. Now, if you're an alcoholic and you find out you're not a drug addict, that's not me giving you permission or leading you to believe you cannot take drugs and not end up back on booze. Because you'll be powerless over where drugs take you, but you won't be powerless over drugs the way a real addict is, and vice versa. A real addict might be absolutely powerless over where booze takes him, but it takes him back to his drug of no choice. And they filter us full of this stuff that say the drug we really have no choice over is our drug of choice. <laughs> They'll tell an alcoholic that his drug, because it was his favorite. It wasn't even his favorite. I knew men and women that hated booze, hated the taste, but they're alcoholic and they have to drink. And it's not their choice. Don't refer to what you are as using your drug of choice. It's your drug of no choice. So what's my truth with alcohol? I mean, with drugs, when I went back with these three terms, moderate, hard, and real. Heroin, I had a couple bouts. I had a habit. It gradually impaired me physically and mentally. I know what it's like to have a habit. It could have even killed me, any one of those shots. But I woke up one day and I made up my mind, I don't like where heroin takes me. I never did it again the rest of my life, and I couldn't quit drinking. I'm a hard drug user, given a sufficiently strong reason, can stop. Cocaine, I had a couple bouts. I know about shooting cocaine. I didn't understand smoking it, because I believe if you can take this much and you've got to do all this rigmarole, but you can take this much and put it in a spoon and shoot it in your arm and get a big bang, why do all that other stuff? And I can tell you about shooting cocaine. I can tell you about the craving. I can tell you about the mental obsession when I'm in the addiction. But I woke up one day and I made up my mind, I don't like the way this stuff makes me feel. And I never did cocaine ever again. Do I believe I can use drugs and not go back to my drug of no choice? No. I'm powerless over drugs because I'm a hard drug user and they always take me back to my drug of no choice, which is booze. I'm a real alcoholic. Maybe you'll find you're both. Maybe you'll think you're a real addict and find out you're a real alcoholic instead. 
Maybe you'll find out you're both. Maybe you'll think you're a real alcoholic and find out you're just a real addict. But find someone that will give you the grace and the dignity through this process to find your own truth. Our job is not to convince people which program they belong in. Our job is to help them find their own truth and let them get free. They might find out they're neither and call you six months later and thank you for helping them get free of AA. I've done that too. So I'm saying to you that the first time and every time since through this process, when I've looked at drugs, I saw that I am a hard drug user, given a sufficiently strong reason, was able to walk away from drugs. The real addict doesn't understand me because he tried that a million times and he uses again. But I'm a real alcoholic, powerless over drugs. I'm powerless over where drugs take me. But the drugs themselves I was able to choose away from. And I'm a real alcoholic. And it surprised me. I thought I was going to find out I was both. If I sit with a real addict, we have one piece missing that I think is necessary for that bond, one alcoholic to another, the basis of our program. Because I talk to him about making up my mind and walking away from heroin, walking away from cocaine, and I lose him. We don't have that connection. I'm not saying I haven't worked with addicts. I have. But I do encourage them to go to the fellowship where they'll have that connection of one addict with another. It's vital. So I found my truth in those three terms. I'm a real alcoholic, powerless over drugs, who was a hard drug user. So on 44, back to 44, they've reviewed these first two points again. When I honestly want to, I can't quit entirely. And when drinking, I have little control over the amount. Yes, I'm an alcoholic. But... Do I believe I'm suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer? And I had to spend some time with that. Then, am I the type that's hopeless? Now, what's hopeless? I had a view that it's a guy laying in the gutter with an extended liver, drinking a bottle of wine on Skid Row. That's not hopeless. He might have hope even if it's in just the next bottle, even if it's in that he might die. And for a lot of us, there's a lot of hope in that. You did not scare me when I was new to drink is to die. You scared me that I might go on feeling the way I was feeling a lot longer and die an ugly alcoholic death. Dying an alcoholic death is not usually quick. It's usually long and tedious and painful. And it can happen right here in AA without drinking. You don't have to drink to die from alcoholism. But I was told hopeless is a man who wants to quit and can't. When you want to quit, but you can't. That's hopeless condition. Wants to quit, but can't. And do I believe that to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are my only two alternatives? Now, why do they say these two alternatives aren't easy to face? You know why? For me? Because I can't pull off either one. That's why those alternatives are not easy to face, because I can't control them. I was not able to die an alcoholic death. I'm a failure at that, because I'm here. And I have not been able to live on a spiritual basis the way I would like to. If I could self-will my spiritual growth, I wouldn't be here today. You would, wouldn't you think after 22 years, I'd be like, I'd be the Dalai Lama and have my own temple, you'd be coming to see me. So the reason those two alternatives are not easy to face is because they're my only two. And now that I think they're my only two alternatives, I think there's a choice in the matter. But the the, the reason they're not easy to face is I don't have any choice in either one of them. I couldn't pull off dying an alcoholic death, and I can't pull off self-willing my own spiritual growth. That's why they're not easy to face. Because once they get you down to two alternatives, you go, well, at least I have those two alternatives. You need to see that you're powerless over those two also. (laughs) So what's the real problem? We've looked at once I start drinking. We've looked at now that I've stopped drinking. We're going to look at the spiritual malady. We've looked at do I suffer from an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer? And am I of the hopeless variety? And do I only have two alternatives that aren't even alternatives? Whether we're looking at any of the points up to this page, the root of the problem is, in the next page, lack of power. That's my problem. I suffer from a disease rooted in lack of power, 
because I don't have the power to control the amount once I start. I don't have the power to keep myself stopped now that I've stopped. I, I, I cannot make the only alternative that I have that's going to conquer this disease happen, and I cannot die an alcoholic death successfully or live on a spiritual basis the way I would like to. I'm going to, I'm going to present you with a picture. I still like pictures. My mind is still terribly... Does, my, my mind is still terribly affected. And sometimes pictures help me. And as we go through each of these considerations, I'd like to show you how the first step continues to step nine. And how you and many people that we know get off the first step at many different points. We'll come back to this in a little bit, but just write the first considerations. Can I control the amount once I start? Can I keep myself stopped now that I've stopped? Can I make my spiritual malady go the, away? Can I heal the spiritual malady? And then we will look at agnosticism, and then self-will, and then defects, and then amends. And I'll say to you that the first step goes down, down, down at each of these considerations, and we watch people get off the ladder going down at each step. For example, if the first consideration is, do I lose control once I start? We hear people that never even get to that because they say, hey, I just don't drink no matter what. They've just gotten off the first step. Then we see people who are absolutely convinced about the craving, but they're going to keep the obsession from happening. And they just got off the first step at the second consideration. Then we see people that are absolutely convinced of the craving. They're absolutely convinced they can't keep themselves sober, but now they're going to make their spiritual life go the way they, the way they would like it to, and they just got off the first step at the, at the third consideration, etc., etc., etc. And I'll show you that as we go, because I believe this. The first step can either take you deeper into step one by the time you get to nine and you have a reason to make nine, or it can take you further away from step one. And I've had both experiences. I've had times, the further away I get from step one, the further away I am from step one. It's my contention that if you pray and it goes the way that it should be directed by God, you will be more aware of step one and step nine than you were when you were in step one. I have a mind that says step one's only true when I'm in it. But now that I'm not in step one, it's not true anymore. I think step one should be a deeper because now in step nine, you're seeing your first step face to face, other people. In inventory, you're seeing it in black and white. Now we're just looking at the symptoms. All we've looked at so far is the first half of step one. Why I'm powerless? Because of the craving and the obsession. So now let's go to see what's behind lack of power. Why I need to find a power by which I can live. It doesn't say we need to find a power so we don't ever drink again. It says we had to find a power by which we could live, and this power had to be a power greater than ourselves. Is that obvious? And the next logical question would be, then, if lack of power is my dilemma, shouldn't finding some power be the solution? How can any of you sitting here today be more than 10 or 15 years sober, having done some work, and still tell people that you're powerless over alcohol and that your lives are unmanageable? When the truth is, something came between you and alcohol, some sort of power came between you and alcohol a long time ago, and you've been given the power to manage your life for a long time. What kind of promise would there be for a newcomer in the room if I said to you, I'm 22 years sober, and I'm powerless over alcohol, and my life is unmanageable? It's not true. Something, some power, not of me, some kind of power or grace or whatever you want to call it came between me and booze 22 years ago and from doing the work I've been given the power to have a manageable life. And doesn't it make sense if the problem is being powerless and unmanageable that the solution should be having some power and some manageability which is what 10 and 11 are all about? This power doesn't originate from me but I found it inside of me. It's a strange paradox. They're not going to say, look in somebody else. Look deep down within something out here. They're going to say, search diligently deep down within yourself. <clears throat> if, <clears throat> if lack of power is the problem, 
shouldn't having some power be the solution? <clears throat> Let's go to page 52. So, I've looked at the first half of step one, and I know now why I'm powerless. I know now what it means to be bodily and mentally different. I know now what it means to be physically powerless once I start and mentally powerless once I stop. But now why is my life unmanageable? Why was my life unmanageable before I ever took a drink? Why did I read this next paragraph on 52 and it fit me, it described me before I ever took a drink? And why does it describe me now, six months sober, dying of untreated alcoholism, why does it fit me now? And why does this paragraph fit me from time to time since then? Because the ego rebuilds, and this had never been treated. And this was there. See, I don't need to ask anymore which came first, the craving, the obsession, or the spiritual malady. I was pouring booze on this spiritual malady. I was experiencing this spiritual malady way before I ever took a drink. Feeling alone, different, out of place as a kid. Dreaming a spaceship was going to land because I felt like it's somebody from another planet. That's what was there before I ever started pouring. Thank God I found something to pour, pour, pour on it. Thank God alcohol treated the spiritual malady. This comes first. This is why we're obsessions of the mind don't just fly around there in outer space and decide who to land on today. The mental obsession comes from an untreated spiritual malady. This is what came first. Because if you really look at this, I bet it describes every one of us before we ever took a drink. And I bet the only thing that ever treated this paragraph was alcohol until God. Only two things have ever treated this pe- this malady, booze and God. Thank God booze treated this spiritual malady. I would have blown my head off feeling the way I felt at age 12. So what does it say? And this fits the new guy. This fits, be, this fits me before I ever took a drink, and this fits me now when, when it's time to do the work. What's, what starts to happen? I start to have trouble with personal relationships. Believe it or not, personal relationships do not take place out here between you and I. They take place in here, and they're reflected out here between you and I. I'm having trouble with personal relationships. I can't control my emotions. I'm prey to misery and depression. Depression is a big part of untreated alcoholism. A discussion during the break. Do I need to take medication or do I need to do the work? There's no answer to that. Do the work and then see if you need medication. See if one through nine treats the spiritual malady or if you still need medication after doing step nine. Because the symptoms of untreated alcoholism and all these other things they say are wrong with us that we need medication for are so similar, but you should at least try the the treatment for alcoholism, the the spiritual malady, and then see what you need. We're not doctors. I do know the symptoms are very similar. And it says here, even if I'm just an alcoholic, I'm going to suffer from misery and depression. I can't make a living that's really satisfactory to my spirit. Are you doing what you feel passionate about? Do you know how many people we know about nowadays that are existing in miserable relationships and jobs that they hate? I'm glad to say to you it's a step up for me to be in love with someone that I want to be with and and be doing what I feel passionate about. That's a big step up for me in sobriety. I spent a lot of time with people I didn't want to be with in jobs that I hated. Living in places I didn't want to live. Making just enough money not to be able to leave where I wanted to get out. (laughs) <laughs> the feeling of uselessness the saddest thing for an alcoholic every one of us reached that place where you feel like you're of no use to anybody you're not needed or wanted or loved by anyone now that's changed maybe now I can drink or maybe I drank no matter how page 52 was but this is still the stuff that needs to be treated Or maybe you've been suffering from this stuff for a long time and you're not drunk and you see how much grace has been involved in your sobriety. But do I believe God can take me past all this stuff? That was the consideration the first time. Where is that? Maybe I can, maybe, maybe, maybe God can take me past all this stuff. That was the consideration the first time and this last time through the word. But how is it really with this stuff? Money? How is it with MasterCard, Visa, American Express? How was it this morning at the kitchen table? 
your wife. How is it inside? Depression, misery. My mind always goes, well, it certainly isn't like it was 22 years ago when I'd take myself off the hook. I stop the tension. See, the stuff might be a lot more subtle now after 22 years, but subtle doesn't mean less dangerous. I don't live with deep-seated resentment on a daily basis like I used to. I don't live with mental obsessions. But I still have some stuff, and this year's stuff is just as deadly as 22 years ago stuff because it's the stuff, and it's the stuff that's blocking me from God. So you look at page 52, and please, if there's anything you can do in prayer, if you can be shown, don't let the unmanageability be separate from the drinking. Or you will start to do the work just to take care of this stuff. And it won't have anything to do with drinking again. And you'll be, you'll be making amends to manage your life, not because you're powerless over alcohol. And you'll experience what a woman said one time, to put it better than anyone I've ever heard. She said, you can be taken forward through the steps. She said, there's also people that can take you backwards through the steps. And I'll tell you what I mean by that later. But going in either direction, don't get stuck on the dash. And I know what she meant. The dash turns upside down into a wall, and you're no longer doing the work because you're powerless. You're doing the work because your life is unmanageable. What do I mean by that? Amends don't have anything to do with drinking again. They have something to do with just making your life better. If the, if the amends are not con connected to the first half of step one, you'll balk. Because you and I are not just going to settle for making things a little bit better. But if we have that fire under us, that the amends are about me being powerless over alcohol again because I'm alcoholic and I can't keep myself sober, then you have the pin, the linchpin. I used to see the steps as a straight line. And when I would start them again, I actually thought, I'm going back through the steps. You can't go back. You can't go back through the steps because the steps aren't a straight line. The steps are a circle. You start at one and it goes to twelve, you're back to one. It's like a clock. And if twelve doesn't bring you to one, I don't know what will. <laughs> How far away am I from a drunk's puke? How many have I seen die? Do I remember that? Do I know what it was like for me? It's the first half of step one that will move you through the work. But underneath every one of these manifestations on page 52 is a drink. You go to the meeting and talk about the relationship like it was just the relationship you were talking about and that it's not a drink underneath waiting to happen. You go to the meeting and talk about selfishness and you think it's just the selfishness you need to get free of, failing to realize there's a drink under that selfishness. You see, when the book says at a certain time, there will be no effective mental defense. You know what my mind says? I know what that certain time would look like, and I know what that certain time would feel like, and I'm just going to not feel or get that bad. You know what I fail to remember? My ego doesn't care what the certain time is. It could be feeling good, it could be feeling bad, or it could be that horrible place that alcoholics hate more than bad or good. That place where you're just not feeling much at all, and you got to get something going. Rage is better than numb. So circumstance doesn't have anything to do with that certain time, nor does emotional state. So the truth is, I don't know when that certain time might be. Bob Olson, who a lot of you have met, he was the one that always used to say, you better do the work because you don't know when you'll need it. <laughs> so how is it really with 52? 52. And if you make a list of the current unmanageability, it's going to be really interesting to find it's a direct reflection of the current agnosticism. Because now we're moving into step two, and this is all you have to consider. Having seen all of this in step one, do I believe there's a power deep down within myself that can keep that obsession from happening and take me past where I am with all this, all this stuff on 52 to levels of life and freedom and existence that I can't even imagine? past the troubles I'm having with personal relationships, past my emotional nature, past the misery, past the depression. And I would like to show you where the list of current unmanageability, if you were to make a quick list right now, 
The list of current unmanageability will become your list of agnosticism, which will become your list of self-will, which will become your first column, which will become your eight-step list. Please, I don't even know where it came from. How do I repeat? The list of current unmanageability. The manifestations of page 52, if listed, will follow you through the work. And if they're connected to booze, the, the truth about alcohol will follow you through the work. Don't let them be separate. The dash doesn't mean they're two separate things. The unmanageability is my powerlessness over alcohol. So if... Uh, what I'm saying is this list of current unmanageability will become your list of agnosticism, which will become your list of self-will, which will become your first column, which will become your eight-step list. I love, I have a, because I don't have a lot, I have a life where I don't have a lot of obscure relationships in my life. I don't have a boss. I don't have people I know vague. The people I know, I know. I love to watch my daytimer, my file of facts, my address book go from my Christmas card list to my first column list to my eight-step list in a matter of a few months. They're the people I love, they're the people I hate, and they're the people I owe amends. <laughs> and it's fun to watch that. You look through your daytimer and you see, ooh, there's some tension. <laughs> a few months ago, it was my Christmas card list of the people I love the most in my life. Now it's my first column. <laughs> Then my first column magically turns into a my amends list, and the people that are going to help me get free are the ones that I'm pissed off at. Ooh. So this list, the current unmanageability, you'll see some are external, some are internal. We got smoking, weight, health, judgment, selfishness, dishonesty. And I start to see the internal manifestations of page 52 bring about the external manifestations of page 52. My agnosticism continues to lead me to believe that I can smoke cigarettes. My agnosticism continues to lead me to believe that I don't have to be concerned about my health until I remember it's a drink. It's not a cigarette. My judgment will take me back to a drink. My beliefs change, my behavior changes with some power. But now we're going to look at where and how are we to find this power. So <clears throat> we're going to look at the second step in two parts. The first part of step two is a simple question. Page 47. We need to ask ourselves but one short question. And this is great for new people, and I'll give you something for those that have been around. And here's the way the book says it. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe, that there is, circle that, that there is a power greater than myself? When I was new, I thought the first part of step two was going to be, do you now believe, or are you even willing to believe in a power greater than yourself? And I was going to go home and come back to you tomorrow with faith. It doesn't even say, do you believe in a power? It doesn't even say, do you have faith in a power. It says, do you now believe or are you even willing to believe that there is, just that there is, that there is something with more power than you? And my first step filled with desperation, and where I come from they call desperation a gift, the gift of desperation, is that if there isn't something greater than me, I'm dead. There was no virtue in my first second step. Nowadays, I'm a big-time believer, and my second step is all flowery and lofty, but I need to get back to that innocence that if there isn't a power greater than myself, I'm dead. So yes, I was willing because of my desperation. That's the paradox of desperation. Normal people think desperation just feels bad and doesn't do much. We have experienced the kind of desperation that feels bad, but it's wonderful. Alkies are the only people that understand a horribly wonderful experience. How can it be both? A really painful, beneficial experience. Normal people don't think like that. My desperation from step one took me to a place where if there isn't something with more power than I have, I'll die. But then I started to see there had always been a power greater than myself. 
that the grace of God didn't begin on my sobriety date. If you hadn't been in the grace of God, how'd you make it to your sobriety date? And the best way to miss seeing the little miracles that are really big and the big miracles that are really little, the way to miss them, just do one thing. Take the credit. Turn your miracles into accomplishments and you'll miss miracle after miracle after miracle. Turn your, turn your miracles into your accomplishments and you won't even realize the grace involved in the next breath. How little I really have to do with anything. How much grace there was in my life before AA. How much grace there's been in my life since AA. So, I was told the first time to work with this question, do you now believe, or are you even willing to believe, that there is a power greater than yourself that I should go through? The logical mind would say, well, to make this consideration, I should go home and write down how much faith I have. I should do some sort of exercise to increase my belief in this power. No, you'll find that this chapter says you should actually go home and see how little you do believe. You should face your agnosticism. Because a lot of us, when faced with, do you believe that there is a power greater than yourself, you'd say, I believe this much, if you could measure it. And then you'll find the chapter says, well, isn't this much of it really about money, worshiping money, or things, or yourself, or your own mind, or others? Or even the beauty of a sunset, the sea or a flower, can be just as distracting as worshiping money or something else. I can get distracted by something out here that I think I have faith in as much as something in here. So what the chapter will do and what I was told to do was go through the entire chapter and mark any word or any statement that helps you face where you don't believe so you can get it down to the right size. Because even new people will say, yeah, I believe that there is a power and I believe this much. And the chapter tears it down. And you say, wow, I, don't, I really only believe this much. And you'll get to your doubt. They talk about honest doubt, worship of other things, um, worshiping the mind as the alpha and the omega. How many of us live that way? If I think it, it's true. <laughs> There's nothing I don't know that's not worth knowing. Then they start to ask you questions like, how do you know what you don't know? Or how do you know where you don't believe? Well, this is the exercise that will locate you to step two as well as step one located you to step one. The work you did in step one. But you don't go home and increase your faith and just add delusion to delusion. You go home and you go through the chapter and you mark any word that, st that sticks out to you or any phrase that sticks out to you that would help somebody face where they don't believe to face your current agnosticism. Our group, in my home group, we're allowed to ask questions as part of the format. It's not crosstalk. It's just anybody can ask anybody anything they would like on tonight's topic. There was an old boy there from the valley who said he did the work on a regular basis, one through nine regularly throughout his sobriety. Everybody loved him. And a young girl who didn't know any better, who was in the steps for the first time looking at her agnosticism, raised her hand and said, can you tell us about your current agnosticism, the last time you went through the steps that you discovered after all those years? He said, current agnosticism? Not only do I not know what you're saying, I've never been agnostic since my first time through the steps. Failing to see those little pockets that will be there after all these years. And I'll tell you where you'll find your current agnosticism is in the list of the current unmanageability. Because wherever there's current unmanageability, there's doubt about God being able to take you past it. And that's why you're having trouble with it. Because if you had full faith in those areas, they wouldn't be unmanageable. They wouldn't be unmanageable no, no matter how they were. In the relationship, not in the relationship. Beginning the relationship, ending the relationship. But I'm having trouble with those areas on 52 because of my current agnosticism. So look at the current agnosticism and ask yourself, because here's the way you got to word this now that you've been around for a while. For the new guy, it's enough to say, do you now believe or are you even willing to believe that there is a power greater than yourself? But what do you say to the new guy that's been proven over and over and over that there is? I mean, the guy that's been around. To the guy that's been around, you got to add one little thing to this question. It'll make it relevant from now until you die. 
Do you now believe, or are you even willing to believe, that this power you say have say you have so much faith in can take you past the way it is now? That past here there's more. But to, to consider that, you've got to see how it is now with 52. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe, God can take me past here? Because I'll tell you what, if anyone in this room, myself included, thinks that there's any area of your life where this is all there is, then God is not... A, is not finite. He's finite. He's not infinite. He's measurable. This is it. Any area of your life you can think of. Emotional stability, peace, freedom, freedom from alcohol, trouble with your uh, uh, the, how great your emotional nature is. If this is all there is, then God isn't everything. So if I see clearly the current unmanageability, I will find the current agnosticism, my doubt. And my doubt will be about whether God can take me past this I've just seen in step one. Do I believe that beyond here there's more? Maybe there's not. Maybe you have a God where you've gone to the well one too many times. You go to the well with a thimble, you get a thimble. That's about a, It might overflow, but that's only going to hold what a thimble can hold. You go to God with this glass, you're only going to get what this glass can hold. What about dropping the size of your box this time? What about dropping the container and going into God as everything? Because that's what's next. With an unlimited, not a container. Oh, it would only be this much. Go to the well for an unlimited supply that you don't, you can't even dream of. And you get to feel, and it adds to the tension. It connects to the first step. It starts to create this tension that's going to move you through the work and follow you all the way. Or you're going to get further away from it. And nine won't have anything to do with drinking again. And you won't finish your meds. So you go through the chapter and you mark the stuff that could help somebody face where they don't believe. Then you get to the second half of step two, which is on page 53. And for some people, there's a lot of work between the first part of step two and the second part of step two. The second part of step two, they call a proposition. The first part was a question. This is a proposition that they say if you've really seen step one, not only will you see you've been crushed by a self-imposed crisis that you can't postpone or evade, you need to fearlessly face the proposition that God is either everything or he's nothing. He either is or he isn't. What is your choice to be? And I'd like to present you with this idea, whether you're doing it the first time or the hundredth time. If you think there's a choice here, you better go back to step one. Because, see, this is a choice you get to make from a place of no choice. And my mind cannot compute that unless I've experienced it. If you think you can make this choice and there's a choice involved in choosing everything or nothing, you're missing something in your first step. But if you see that you've actually had an experience where you see there's no choice and from that place of grace, you get to choose God as everything. That's the way to see it. I make this choice from a place of no choice. Most people think, how could you make a place a choice from no choice? You only can make a choice when there's a choice. No, this is another paradox. We get to make this choice because there is no choice. <laughs> It's the only way I know to explain it. But I've experienced it. And I get to choose. And if God is everything, the debate is out of it. And don't bring it up again. Don't tell me God ain't in that what you're calling squabbling to me about when you're in step 10. Don't tell me God ain't in September 11th. Everything or nothing. My God, who brought more people to God than the devil? A virtue? No. Even the devil got pinned. God works in mysterious ways. Who brought more people in this room to the God than, than alcohol? You're going to hate alcohol? How can you hate alcohol if it brought you to a spiritual awakening? How can you hate alcohol if it eliminated options? Normal people in church don't even get eliminated to seek God. They don't even need to seek God. They just need to be around people that are seeking God. They don't need a personal relationship. They just need a conception. And they go on their life with power. And I'll also tell you this. Coming up with a conception is only going to be a great burden. 
Getting free of some old ideas about God can be great. It's not Santa Claus. He's not going to punish me. It's not a punishing God. But I'll tell you this. Once you get to a conception like everything, drop any other ideas. Because I believe this. Any idea about God isn't God. Any idea about God isn't God. And he's as much everything as he is no thing. So even these terms don't do you much good after a while, but it's good to see that you've got a choice here, but you really don't have a choice here. And if that makes sense, then you're in the right place. <laughs> I, accepting that God is everything blocks me from seeing he's also no thing. But they say you can make a choice, and I chose. God is everything or I'm nothing. That was my first second step. God either is or I ain't. God is either everything or I'm nothing. That was my choice. Last time I chose, because it does say it's a choice. You know what I chose last time after 21 years? He's both. And that choice moved me on. He's as much in everything as he is in nothing. Now, to work with that part of the second step, we were given a great tool. Go back through the whole chapter with another color. And mark every word or every statement that would take you from believing in or believing that there is to choosing everything. You'll find there are more positive statements. As soon as a man can say he's willing, he's well on his way. You'll find them. They'll stand out to you because you saw the statements that helped you see where you don't believe. Now you're going to look for statements that take you from your willingness to believe to choosing from bridge to shore. It's sometimes a, it's sometimes a long journey. It's sometimes a moment. But that space between your head and your heart is a big distance sometimes. But you will find those statements, they'll stand out to you. They're more positive statements. And they make an assumption that you've, you're at least willing to believe that there is a power. And mark them. And start to look at those statements in prayer. And they will move you to choosing. This is my choice. I get to choose. See the grace in that. The idea that anyone in this room gets to Choose this proposition, everything or nothing, is a reflection of how much grace you're already in. And you're only in the second step. Please don't believe these people that tell you there's 12 promises halfway through the ninth step and that's it. You're going to find promises at every step. If all there is is 12 promises that are going to amaze me before I'm halfway through amends, forget about it. Because I ain't never getting halfway through amends. You're going to find some promises of what will happen if you don't move on. You're going to find some great promises before the third step prayer, after the fifth step, even in step one, even here. As soon as a man can say he's willing, he's well on his way. It's been repeatedly proven among us that on this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. And that's good to make note of at that first half of step two on 47. But that's your cornerstone. The cornerstone at this point doesn't make much sense. You don't even know what they're talking about. But you're going to want to know what those stones are about when you return home from a fist step and they ask you to review the stones and the cement. The cement you'll find on the first page of there is the solution. And the cement in your foundation. The foundation is one, two, and three. The cement is sharing in a common problem and a common solution. One element of the cement is sharing in a common problem. But if that by itself was enough, we would have recovered in the county jail. If all we needed was to be around people with the same problem. The other part of that cement is sharing with people that have a common solution. Now, we've made this foundation in the first three steps. And the first stone we're going to put on this arch they're going to talk about later is the cornerstone that I'm willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself. Upon this simple cornerstone... A wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. <clears throat> I would love, as I said earlier, now we're only through the second step and it's lunchtime, and we'll move at whatever pace we're moved at, but I would have loved if we could have spent more time on those chapters. But keep this in mind. We have used 43 numbered pages, Ten in the doctor's opinion, that's 53, and a half and a half and a paragraph. We have used about 54 pages to look at one step. 54 out of 99 
in the first 11 steps. 54 out of 99 pages to look at one step. That's how important the first step is. We've used the chapter to the agnostic to look at step two. And now you get to how it works. And the paragraph before the ABCs, once again, they give you a great review like they have at every other every other stage. Now, before the ABCs, they tell you what you've done. The description of the alcoholic is my first step. The chapter to the agnostic is my second step. And my personal adventures before and after, what do they mean with that? What do they mean, my personal adventures before and after? Before and after what? So here's the way I see it now that I've experienced it. The work I've done in step one, which is the description of the alcoholic. The work I've done in step two, which is the chapter to the agnostic. And my personal adventures before the first drink and after the first drink has made clear that I'm alcoholic, drunk or sober, and that I can't manage my own life, drunk or sober, before or after. That probably no human power can relieve my alcoholism, drunk or sober. And that no human power, I'm sorry, and that God can and will if I seek it. So before and after means to me exactly what we've looked at up to here. After the first drink, which is where we started. Before the first drink, which is the next part of step one. And my personal adventures. Because, see, there's the point I was missing. I knew that I was alcoholic when I was drinking. But am I still alcoholic sober? I knew that no human power could relieve what I suffered from drinking. But now do I believe there's a human power that can relieve what I suffer from sober? So the way I see that paragraph now is that the description of the alcoholic, step one, the chapter to the agnostic, step two, and my own personal adventures, drunk or sober, has made clear that drunk or sober, I'm alcoholic and can't manage my own life, drunk or sober. That no human power can relieve my alcoholism, drunk or sober, and that God could and would. Now there was a big point there for me, because I had to change that to can and will. They're talking about we. I had no problem believing that God could, that he can. I know he can. I've seen it in you. But do I believe he will for me? There were some old ideas. He can for you, but he won't for me. So I sat with C for a while. So once again, do it in prayer. Has the work you've done really convinced you of these three pertinent ideas? Because the next, the next question is going to be, are you convinced? So it could be a, it could be a while on the ABCs because it, it's summing up all the work you've done up to that page. I'm the guy at a meeting one night when they were talking about the promises on 84 or whatever page it was. And I said, how do you get the promises on page 84? And some old boy looked at me and said, it's really simple. Do everything from 1 to 83. (laughs) It's that simple, right? So it's time to go to lunch. But I would say if anybody in the room is having any sort of experience, and during lunch you can pray for an open mind and a new experience with what's going to go on from here till 5.30, you might sit quietly for five minutes. Read that paragraph before the ABCs. Read the ABCs really slowly. Ask yourself, are you convinced? And look at the first requirement to the third step. There is a requirement to the third step. And that is, am I convinced that my life run on self-will doesn't work? It's not successful. Because from that word, our, our description of the alcoholic, to the second line in the third paragraph, which is the first requirement is I'd be convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success. That's everything we've done and right where we're at before taking the third step. So we'll come back at two. Thanks. Thanks.